Welcome to Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Today we have an exciting book for you, Crazy Rich, it's called, Power, Scandal, and Tragedy Inside the Johnson & Johnson Dynasties by Jerry Oppenheimer, published by St. Martin's Press. Uh, the Harper's Bazaar says this is that this is a can't-put-down chronicle of fortune and fall. Uh, starred book list says Oppenheimer's 11th biography chronicles five generations of the Johnson dynasty through adulterous affairs, ugly divorces, drug and alcohol addictions, tragic accidents, sometimes called uh, the most dysfunctional family in America, the story of Johnson & Johnson. Jerry, welcome. How are you today? Bill, thank you so much for having me. Uh, boy, uh, <laughs> it sounds depressing, <laughs> but it, but you know it's it, it's a it's a fascinating story about a, a family uh, later generations having so much unearned wealth and uh, not knowing how to deal with it and getting involved in all kinds of problems and tragedies and scandals and it, it seems to be unending. Well, you're you're quite experienced at writing biographies on um, large um, historical wealthy American families like the Kennedys, the Hiltons. You've written on Barbara Walters, uh, Martha Stewart, etc. Is the Johnson and Johnson clan the the most dysfunctional you've uh, you've written about? They're perhaps uh, the most dysfunctional family in the <laughs> Fortune 500. An mm-hmm. interesting group, you know. Well, a number of people I interviewed who were close to this family, including family members, compared some of their issues uh, over the generations uh, to the Kennedy clan. Uh, in many ways, they suffered uh, uh, you know, tragedies and scandals and unending problems. Uh, but unlike the Kennedys, um, few, if any, of the Johnsons got into public service. Uh, once the originators of the company, which was started in the 1800s, did their thing and made it extremely successful. And then one later generation, um, controlled by uh, Robert Wood Johnson, who actually donated his fortune to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which mm-hmm. is a very famous, very famous, yes, very famous foundation that issues tons of money to hospitals, to medical research. Few, if any, others really have done anything with their with their great fortunes. Money was always both a blessing and a curse for mm-hmm. members of this family. Is that true for, for all the, the kind of big wealthy families? Is money kind of the root of, of their problems? I, you know, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, when I, as you had mentioned, I've written about other iconic uh, dynasties and did not find this kind of, other than the Kennedys, this kind of uh, dysfunctionality that that exists with the Johnsons. I mean, certainly there are Johnsons who have been, contemporary Johnsons who have been quite successful, one of whom owns the New York Jets football team, mm-hmm. uh, Woody Johnson. And in fact, you know, the New York sports writers call that team rather dysfunctional also. <laughs> With uh, Tim Tebow and some other players who haven't been very successful, but Woody bought that team for six hundred and thirty million dollars, the highest price ever paid for a football team, and that all of that money was unearned wealth from the the trust that he inherited and the the various wills that you know and money that was left to him over the years. Well, he inherited um, like all of his siblings. Uh, was it ten million when they turned twenty one? Yeah, they all. Uh, the trusts were established in such a way that when they all hit the age of 21, they inherited $10 million. That's crazy. And the trusts were then set up in a way that every five years or a certain number of years thereafter, another amount of tens of millions would be given to them up until the age of 40 or 45. You know, two of Woody's siblings, and that falls into the tragedy category, Mm -hmm. Both having inherited that kind of money, uh, Willard uh, Johnson um, died in a uh, motorcycle accident just weeks after his brother Keith Johnson died of a drug overdose in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, typical of, um, or atypical of, the kind of uh, hurt that that Woody has been faced with over the years, and that other members of this 
dynasty through the generations have been faced with. So Woody, Woody, when he was quite young, he lost two brothers to tragedy within very little, within right, six they're, weeks they're of each other. Right, they're the brothers I just mentioned, Willard and, mm-hmm. and Keith Johnson, um, never lived past the age of uh, their mid-twenties. Mm. And then, uh, but I, I go back to that $10 million when you're 21 years old. If I had inherited tw- $10 million when I was 21, um, I, I don't think I would have seen 30. Well, that, that's mm. possible, and, and they died in an era... Um, Keith and Willard died in the era of the 70s when, mm-hmm. you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and certainly mm-hmm. drugs were a part of it. But this kind of um, money that this family has, you know, one, one of the things that underscores it, back in 1944, Robert Wood Johnson Jr., who was known as a general, um, took the, this family-owned company public on the New York Stock Exchange. The initial public offering of stock was $37.50 a share. So if you bought a block of 100 shares, it would cost $3,750. Right. That probably was a lot of money during wartime yeah, absolutely. anyway. Um, but those 100 shares, by the end of the 20th century, were worth $12 million, <laughs> which gives you kind of an idea of the amount of stock um, the family members had mm-hmm. and what their wealth mushroom to when that stock went public. Well, like you point out, uh, Woody's um, divorce uh, not so long ago cost him $100 million. $100 million, and, um, you know, that was basically just a, uh, a quick write-off to his huge fortune. He paid <laughs> $630 million for the team. That, the value of that, of the New York Jets, by the way, doubled. is now double. Yeah. There's so, a good investment. Wow. Very good investment, and it was a good investment, I think, in Woody's mind to uh, uh, delist his wife. <laughs> <laughs> he married a much younger woman uh, before their their marriage. Actually, she had two children. Woody finally got a namesake because in his first marriage with the woman who uh, walked away with a hundred million dollars, they had three daughters, and one of those daughters became a figure in the headlines, Casey Johnson, yes. who uh, died in uh, 2010 at the age of 30, and she had become a kind of a tabloid train wreck in the gossip columns, having great public affairs involved in drugs and alcohol. Again, another sad note mm-hmm. to uh, the contemporary Johnson. Well, you have interesting pictures of her in, in, in the book here. I like the collection of pictures. It helps a lot to keep the labyrinth of this family you know, straight in your mind because there's a lot of people. To... One of the things that was interesting in my research and doing the photo research was I had a, a, um, gotten in contact with Johnson & Johnson, the company, um, and was seeking... Historic photos. They they have a wonderful website of you know the early factory and the early founders and and I hope to use some of those photos. Mm-hmm. And they blacklisted me. They basically <laughs> said if you're writing about the family, mm-hmm. we're not going we're to not going cooperate. To Whereas members of the family did cooperate. What's interesting about Johnson and Johnson is in the late 60s uh the then president of johnson and johnson woody johnson's father in fact bobby johnson was fired very uh, publicly and very humiliatingly mm-hmm. by woody's grandfather the general mm-hmm. and uh, that they were the last of the johnsons to actually be involved in, in the, the corporate business. end of the company mm-hmm. but since then uh, Johnson family members are among the largest stockholders in the mm-hmm. company. And, in fact, when they had their public um, stockholders meeting, I believe, last year, they, they ruled against uh, salary increases for top executives and for the CEO, mainly because the company now is having some problems with products and with management issues. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they, rule, they, they they tend to have... a a uh, very unofficial ruling still in that company. Well, let's talk about where the company uh, started. Uh, how did it get going uh, to begin with? I mean, I know from the book, I know the story, but I think it's an interesting one. I want you to tell it. Yeah, back in the uh, late 1800s, uh, 
uh, doctors, physicians were still treating wounds, people's wounds, with rags or with just mm-hmm. cloth that they grabbed from somewhere. And three first-generation Johnson boys, basically not very well educated, coming from Pennsylvania, poor Pennsylvania farm family. Uh, one of them, the first Robert Wood Johnson, had a very strong entrepreneurial spirit, saw a need for antiseptic bandages Mm -hmm. and materials that doctors did not have. And they got together with Joseph Lister and some other brilliant uh, people in the medical profession and developed these products. And that that was the spark that ignited what has become a uh, uh, you know, a multinational company with businesses in 260. So that's countries. where the that's where the band aid came from. That's where the band aid. Well, the band aid <laughs> is an interesting story. That the band aid was really invented. I, I believe that I have it in the book in the 1930s, and uh, kind of a low level employee who uh, worked at the uh, Johnson and Johnson headquarters in New Brunswick had recently gotten married. He had a young wife who was constantly cutting herself <laughs> cooking in the kitchen. <laughs> and he he finally ran in one day with a strip of adhesive tape, a clumsy looking strip of adhesive mm-hmm. tape, and he put some cotton on it and he wrapped it around her wound and he pitched it to his bosses and they said, Hmm, a product, let's call it the band aid <laughs> And you know, the first couple of years it didn't do very well but eventually mm-hmm. took off and is one of the iconic products along with mm-hmm. baby oil and baby powder, uh, everything that practically the world grew up on. Well, I wanted to make sure that we distinguish it from the S.C. Johnson Company, which is more of the household product, not the health line of things. Now, Johnson & Johnson is the product you see in every CVS pharmacy in the country and every other neighborhood drugstore with the Johnson & Johnson scroll uh, signature on the box in mm-hmm. red. And, uh, you know, one of their iconic products uh, iconic uh, images was mm. the Red Cross. Yes, it, I love that story. The Red Cross, that was very gutsy of him to steal that. It was, they, uh, Robert Johnson basically appropriated from a very famous historical figure, Clara Barton, yes. who founded the uh, the American Red Cross. And uh, they saw it as you know the perfect kind of symbol for their early first aid product. And so it they was. just went ahead and unauthor- without her, without Miss Barton's authorization, plastered it all over their products. She was furious when she discovered it. She actually even went to Washington to try and get legislation, to try and get help, to uh, to go against the Johnson boys. Unsuccessful, and in the end, uh, she agreed uh, for one crisp one dollar bill to give them the authority to use the Red Cross. I don't understand that. I don't know how she sold out so... (laughs) I don't understand it either. Uh, In fact, in my research, and I literally interviewed hundreds of people for this book, I tried to track down uh, descendants of Clara Barton who mm -hmm. might have some inkling of why she She caved in. and, And the only thing I can... I'm clear on is she... Just love the adulation that uh, Robert Wood Johnson, who was the ultimate schmoozer, mm-hmm. uh, gave her. In fact, shortly after they got permission to use the Red Cross, they produced a, a magazine, I think it was called Red Cross Notes or Red Cross mm-hmm. News, and they put a Clara Barton esque nurse like figure all in virginal white on the cover, and she was thrilled. So I guess in those days, uh, uh, you know, a woman like her wasn't as litigious as <laughs> she might be today. Well, you know, if, if it happened today, she would just get into one of those philanthropic marketing agreements where, you know, every every dollar you spend on Johnson & Johnson has, uh, you know, a nickel that goes to the Red Cross. Exactly, mm-hmm. and, and there was none of that. Yeah. As far as I could determine from talking to Red Cross officials, mm-hmm. there was no, uh, you know, she wasn't getting any royalties. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I'm with you. It just uh, is, is perplexing to think that she owned this symbol that was worth so much and got nothing for it. There were other companies, too, that were appropriating that symbol. There was a Red Cross cigar and a Red Cross liquor, and mm-hmm. but none of them, you know, 
used it to the advantage that the uh, early Johnson brothers used it to. Well, now another fascinating story within the book is uh, when uh, Woody's dad tells him that if he wants to learn about business, he needs to go find an experienced Jewish businessman and learn business from him. Very interesting. Um, uh, That actually came from uh, a young man who became a partner of Woody Johnson uh, Mm -hmm. back in the uh, 70s, early 80s, in which they were developing condominium projects Mm -hmm. in South Florida. This was long before Woody Johnson, you know, bought the New York Jets. But but did, did you talk to that guy, the guy who was his partner? Did you interview I him? I had extensive interviews mm-hmm. with uh, Michael Spielvogel, mm-hmm. who was the uh, the uh, business partner, and uh, a partnership mm-hmm. that ended on bad terms. But mm-hmm. Spielvogel never had forgotten how um, he had met Woody Johnson down in Florida. One day he gets a call. He's back in his office in, on Long Island. gets a call from Woody. He doesn't even remember his name, Woody Johnson, says, I'd like to come in and meet with you. And at that meeting, says that I want to get into business. And Woody just, just used, you know, used the word business, business. B-I-D-N-S, <laughs> trying to sound cool, I guess. Uh-huh. And um, told Spielvogel that uh, my father, his father, Bobby Johnson, the one who was fired by Woody's grandfather, the president, had advised him that he should get involved in business, and his first partner should be someone who was Jewish and someone who didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth like Woody did, mm-hmm. was he, and someone who, who was making it on his own. Spielvogel turned out to be that guy. Spielvogel remembered that meeting and told me how he either thought this guy was off the wall or was going to kick him out because he thought maybe there was a strain of anti Semitism coming through the fact that the only good businessman you could be involved with would be Jewish. Uh-huh. But in, in any way, these two guys hooked up, and uh, it was while they were developing a, a big condominium apartment complex in Fort Lauderdale that Woody met the woman who became his first wife. She is the one who, some 25 years later, divorced him and walked away with a $100 million settlement. But when she met him, did she know who he was? Well, I interviewed the people she worked for, and they told me that she was a very, very aggressive young woman and uh, had looked into who his background was, saw that he was one of the Johnson & Johnson heirs, and it was their contention that she saw a great opportunity and took advantage of it. But in in effect, they did fall in love. Mm -hmm and had three daughters, one of whom also becomes a figure in the book, and that's Casey Johnson, who, uh, you know, died a couple of years ago, having uh, become, uh, you know, a tabloid figure involved with a TV reality star, uh, another woman who publicly they said they were going to be married, and this was surely before Casey died. What was that lady's name, Tequila? Tequila Tequila. <laughs> and she was a very popular TV reality star show. She um, presented herself as bisexual or being gay. Uh, she claimed uh, in the days before uh, Casey Johnson died that they were going to be married. She, she talked publicly about Casey being her, quote, wifey, unquote. Mm-hmm. She talked about Casey giving her a big diamond ring. Uh, and they were photographed together, uh, you know, kissing, mm-hmm. uh, all of which caused the family, particularly her father, Woody, and her mother, uh, Sal Johnson, then divorced from Woody, to cringe. It was just mm-hmm. horrific for this very private Byzantine dynasty to have this kind of heiress from the dynasty so publicly embarrassing them. Yeah, because I noticed that Woody, even with the real estate business, he he hung in the background. He didn't want people to to know who he was. Yeah, yeah, he he was he's still a very private guy, but mm-hmm. back then especially he was very private. And there were a lot of scandals going on at that time. His mother was involved in a uh, in a divorce. There was uh, an aunt of his, Mary Lee Johnson, who uh, was involved in in divorces she was claiming publicly that 
her father, Seward Johnson, uh, who was one of the rulers of the company and was a also a playboy, uh, had been molesting her from the time she was a child. She made this claim after he died. Mm. She was also involved in a divorce where she was claiming her husband, one of three husbands at the time, had put out a murder contract on oh. her to inherit some of her fortune. That became huge tabloid headlines around the country. <laughs> you know, going into the research of this family, you know, I kept coming away. My jaw was dropping lower <laughs> and lower. And, and, you know, I'm a cynical journalist who's written a number of books uh, like, about people like this. And this, this really was a shocker. So you're a person who's dug into the skeletons in many closets, and even you were shocked. Exactly. <laughs> precisely. I and, wanted you know, to ask there's you. nothing evil. About, I, you know, I want to make it clear that anyone who has an interest mm. in the story uh, or buying the book, these are not evil people. I mean, mm. they're, they're all decent, nice people. They just did not, uh, did not know how to control this wealth that they had. Mm. And uh, it's very sad and in many ways very tragic. And most, if not all, of the uh, horrors they faced was attributable to the vast fortunes they had inherited and the psychological psychological impact on them Mm -hmm. of all that unearned wealth. I mean, it's hard to imagine that huge amounts of money are going to make your life horrific, but that's what happened in this particular case, unlike the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of comparisons in terms of all the bad things that happened to the Kennedys and the bad things that happened to the Johnsons. But in the Kennedys' case, so many of them went into public service and were highly respected, whereas many of the Johnsons stayed in the background and just dealt with the issues of having all of this money. Well, as you have studied a lot of families of, of wealth, uh, what would be your advice to someone who who gets wealthy? What, I mean, it seems to me it's a no-brainer. You don't give a 21-year-old $10 million dollars. But what, what? how do you manage that wealth in a way that uh, allows people to live productive lives? Well, I think today there are, there are you know, anyone who ha- gets into that position of having a lot of money will have very ethical money managers surrounding them, advisors, financial advisors. A lot of the Johnsons, like Woody's brothers and Woody himself early on, had none of that. And if they did have it, they were, they were yes men, who went along with whatever they wanted. I mean, if you take a look at the people today, you know, average Joes who win the Powerball lotteries and suddenly, you know, went from jobs in gasoline stations to having $200 million and how so many of them eventually lose the money and have horrors in their lives because they didn't get the proper advice and the proper guidance. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, look, there was that guy that, uh, I guess, last year won uh, the lottery, and then his wife took out a contract on him. Mm. That certainly would have never happened had he not won the lottery. <laughs> well, and in the Johnson family, uh, Mary Lee Johnson's uh, mm. uh, husband, who was a very prominent New York psychiatrist, according to her, took out a contract on her <laughs> in order to inherit, I think it was $40 million from one of her wills. Well, the, there was another story here early on about, I, I forget which one because there's so many so many Johnsons here, but uh, it's the story of the, the guy who married and his, his wife was having an ongoing affair, or at least he believed oh. he was, and then... Yeah, the, the, the marriage from hell, <laughs> we might call it. Uh, this is uh, Seward Johnson Jr. Actually, Seward Johnson Jr. is known today as a very prominent, very successful and controversial sculptor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's done some brilliant work all over the world. He's been noted in art journals, et cetera, et cetera. But in his early days, the guy was a wreck. uh, uh, His father, Seward Johnson Sr., refused to have him work within the company. He considered his son, Seward Jr., adult, Mm -hmm. uh, D-O-L-T, not Mm A-D-U-L-T, And uh, uh, finally, in his in his mid twenties, he met a woman, uh, and he fell in love. And he thought this would change his his life around. Well, as it turned out, she had had several previous marriages. She was a, a stunning beauty, um, and within 
a year or two of their marriage, she had live-in lovers, and he was being treated basically as a cuckold in the in the household. Mm -hmm. It was a shootout at one time when he had private detectives uh, trying to get evidence of her adultery. Um, yeah, and then he pulled a gun on a private detective, <laughs> shot him in the face. <laughs> Uh, you know, you couldn't make this up in it's, fiction. It's Keystone Cops, you know. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, it became a huge, uh, huge scandal. They were finally divorced. And um, But he, he always doubted a, the paternity. Normal life since. Excuse me? I said he always doubted the paternity of his daughter. And well, yeah, I never... was just going, just going to mention that. During his marriage to uh, Barbara Johnson, they had a daughter... But he claimed for years and years that that was not his daughter, that it was the uh, daughter of one of her lovers who was actually living in the house. And uh, that battle continued up until just recently when she finally uh, received a $17 million uh, settlement, which she felt was her due. But the legal battles over that went on for years, whether he was or was not her father. And uh, another case that I deal with in the book is the battle that went on for a dozen years over one single word, and that word was the word spouse. Uh, one of the uh, survivors of one of the marriages to a Johnson uh, heiress was claiming he was he should still be considered uh, her husband even after death, and was battling to uh, to get. Something like forty or fifty million dollars, and uh, for a dozen years, you can imagine the legal fees oh, wow. that were, uh, you know, that accrued over one word, over one word, <laughs> most expensive word in history. Exactly. Right. The uh, I want to ask you. Uh, we only have about two minutes, but uh, what is the difference between an authorized biography and an unauthorized biography? I mean, I certainly, I understand the terms. But from the perspective of one writing them, what's the advantage of each? Well, I think the advantage of the so-called unauthorized biography, which I, I think a, a better word term for that would be an independent biography, is that you're not getting all of your information from the subject. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in, in this book, even though uh, Crazy Rich is an unauthorized biography, I had many interviews with family members mm -hmm who, in effect, were then authorizing uh, me to use Is their that, words mm -hmm. and their memories. But the, 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 unauth the authorized biography really is you're getting one side of the story. You are listening to what the, uh, the person is telling you, and basically you are just turning that into pages in the book, whereas an unauthorized biography you have the freedom and the free will to do all of the investigative reporting you need to do and interview both sides of the story, not just the one side. So I, I've always felt that the so-called unauthorized biography gives the reader a better view and a more fair and more objective view of the subject. Well, Jerry, I want to thank you for joining us today. The book is Crazy Rich, Power, Scandal, and Tragedy Inside the Johnson & Johnson Dynasty. Uh, Jerry Oppenheimer is New York Times bestselling author, also of Martha Stewart, Just Desserts, which uh, I think is a great title. So uh, pick it up, Crazy Rich. Jerry, what's your next book? I am now working on a biography of the uh, son of uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who uh, is one of the few Kennedys who hasn't been the subject of a biography, and it, it is a... Uh, fascinating life this man uh, has led and is still leading and just a year ago his wife committed suicide which kind of adds an element of what is going on here in his life um, so that, that's what I'm working on now. Well, when you finish that one come back and talk to us okay? I hope to okay. thank you thank so you. much you have a great day